Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and I feel very privileged. Except that you've set, raised the bar, and, and I was most afraid of you. <laughs> Having said that, I am a villager. I come from Bihar, a village that still lives in the 16th century, and I went there some time back. Actually, it recedes every time I go there. When I was there, it was in my times, and when I went 10 years later, it was another century behind. Every time I go, I lose a century in my village. And don't be mistaken by the suit I wear, because I remember Kuldeep Nayar. Heard of Kuldeep Nayar? He was a great journalist of India, and he was my colleague. One day after about 10 years of leaving journalism, I met him in a plane, sitting right, right next to me, seat 1A, mine used to be 1C. So I said, hi, Kuldeep. He looks at me, Pashana nahi, Satish Chha. He got up, oh, you used to be so thin. I said, then I was the face of India. Now I have become like you. So don't be mistaken, I still am the same villager. I, I can't forget, I come from a village where the per capita income is, you know how much? India's is $1,000. My village is $200 per capita income. And all the difference that was made to my life, I look at that as the possibility of what we can do to India. My cousin, who is my age, he still lives in the same $200 per capita income framework. And I got a scholarship from the government of India, 10 rupees a month for five years, 50 for four years, 110 for two years, grand total of 5,640. And I think I paid several thousand times in the taxes. If government of India understood that, the, perhaps the finest ROI you could have was in investing in your own people. And that's what I told Kuldeep Nayar, that when I met him first, I represented India and its poor. Now I had become part of him, like him. That is one challenge India has. You heard of demographic dividend. And if everybody was as good as just being a bike rider and mechanic, how good that will be? Or everybody was as good as being a NASA scientist, how good that would be and what the differential is. One more point I'd like to make is there are 30 million Indians who represent our diaspora. And we are about 1.3 billion, 1,300 million in India. Those 30 million earn about more than half of what India earns with 1,300 million people. Does it say something to us? That is the gap that we have. Can we have some light in the back, please? So I want to walk you through this, what I thought. If education may, can make that difference, what was coming in the way, and I was editor of the Neman Times of India group, gave me an option to look at the large canvas. And I looked at the canvas and I said, can we draft every capable Indian to educate all the rest, just like the Western world does with its people for war? Can we do that for education and peace? I was told by our leadership that that's not possible in democracy. So we had to wait until technology came. And when cell phones came, we realized what we couldn't do in 100 years or 70, 80 years, cell phones did 100 times more in just about 10 years. Today, there are more cell phones in India than the number of people, technically speaking. So that's when someone was thinking about it, and they had 40, 50 years of research experience, and they talked about how do you transform the world of people's learning, the way cell phone transform, how we communicate. So children, children as a mission, because children are our future. If you're going to leave 95% of India where the fifth percentile represents anyone who has a car, his driver, that won't be a great nation, so to say. So how do you look at it? I look at this as India has a national emergency in learning, in education. It's like a cancer we are not recognizing. It's as urgent as that. And when you have such a problem at large scale, and by the way, my wife founded Polio Plus in India in 1987. She came back from the University of Michigan to start the program. I'm told that's perhaps the perhaps only successful program of public health policy in this country where we declared on one day that we had no polio incident. There'll be some exceptions when, once in a while, but that was one program. Something like that has to be done to ignorance, a vaccine against ignorance. Just like you, see, you can see Salk and this is against cholera. So what's wrong with us today is, you know, I was at another, another event at IIM, some IIM. I said two plus two, four. 
2 and 2, 4. 2 plus 3, 5. 2 and 3, 5. They all said 5. I said, why is it only 2 and 3 is 5? Why not 6? Why not 9? Why not 2 by 3? Why not 1? Why not minus 1? That's the limitation. And where does it come from? And I, from, I know from my own experience. When I went to a study in a US university, I found the first day I could easily answer every question. It took me 10 years to understand why I couldn't answer the second day or third day, because my learning was teacher told me so I knew, but I couldn't imagine. The question is imagining what we teach, we teach the wrong thing. We don't have enough scientists, we don't have enough engineers, we don't teach them how to think in terms of connecting the dots. How do you imagine? How do you research? We don't have, and the point is this, we don't think of future first. We don't think of where we, we are headed. Just like in the 80s, we began thinking of technology in zeros and ones, we had to think in terms of what's the next language, what's the next science, what's emerging, what's, what will be required 20, 30 years from now, and what are we preparing our people for? India's IT industry is just a couple of million people strong. Just about a million people are in the services of the global market, about a million are basically in the service of the Indian market. That's what we are doing. But we are a 1,300 million strong people. How do we get to the next stage? We are looking at what's happening in the world. This is the biotechnology revolution which is waiting to happen. And that will be another 30, 40 year old long curve. Life's, are we ready for that? We teach in the wrong manner. We tell the rote learning. A teacher teaches, students supposed to learn, and and that's not the way they actually, they, they, they think knowledge is finite. They can only be taught everything in a classroom. Imagine this, in the beginning, the first three, four, five years, how do we learn? There's no teacher there. And suddenly we start going to school and teacher becomes the only way to learn. So teaching versus learning, here teacher is pouring knowledge into the head of the student. And we're talking about teamwork. How do you look at learning in the times of screens? learning before screen and after screen are two different things altogether. But we are still discovering when we brought OLPC in 2006 as an idea, it didn't exist then. Government of India said pedagogy is suspect. And when they agreed that screens were OK, then they changed the context. They said, we will turn that into some sakshat, which never happened, and akash, which hasn't happened either. They reduced, it's like reducing God to stone. So they said education to some tablet rather than thinking of what education means. Uh, the profile of the citizen of the 21st century won't be like what you and I have known so far. They have to think in terms of various new forms of knowledge or, or ingredients of knowledge that we must learn. We need curiosity, creativity, communi communication. Critical thinking is something we need the most. Problem solving approaches that we need the most. If you look at the learning brain, we, we, we look at uh, our brain as a teacher has a teaching brain, a child has a learning brain, and uh, somebody has a reading brain, but we all have the, all the brains. So a child can learn from child, teachers can learn from children, and that's what we noticed when we started seeing how screen-based learning can help people learn from each other. Uh, I'm trying to, we also teach the wrong speed. So imagine this. If you're looking at the way digital learning works, in the beginning, A was for Apple. One plus one was two. But when you give somebody access to screen, what does a child do? He doesn't, just, just doesn't look at one plus one is two, looks at one, 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 ad infinitum until they stop. They don't stop learning. Let them, let them explore. And the limitations to one plus one is two or A for Apple disappears. They begin to form words. In three to four, five months, they begin to program at the age of five and six. If you explore that, if you see that, you will begin to think in terms of how do you change the way they learn. Wrong order of magnitude, incrementalism versus scalability. It's not something you're looking at. One gentleman decided to look at entire area of his town and donated this laptop to everyone. He said, everyone should have it. And let's, if it's a problem of billion people, you can't solve by 100 or 500 or 1,000 to begin with a million, begin with as many as you can. So scalability is the question. This is the laptop that MIT created. I'm showing this to you because it is not just a laptop. It was uh, actually spoken about three, four times at TED, and, and it was when it was conceived, when it was produced, when the experiences came, there was also curiosity. This can change the way we learn. 
because we are looking at reaching out to a billion people. Speed is something which is very important. We can cover the ground today in five years so that no child would be deprived of the pinnacle of human achievement in terms of knowledge and learning in about 15 years' time frame. So one big challenge we have is, how do we reach out to a billion children who are being educated, taught, or indoctrinated by people for various things, which things are things you, you and I don't want to talk about. They're about violence. They're about uh, things that happen in, in, in war zones. They're about uh, um, what happens in the underground world, so to say. So one is to do nothing or to bring them all together. And I'm trying to just look at the questions of India. Do you know that India has the largest number of people who are not literate already? We don't have to wait for that. Do you remember that we were a nation of 360 million people when we were born in 47? Today, we have more than 800 million people who can't read and write. That's the accomplishment we have had in 65 years of freedom. So I don't want to go through the statistic. Basic point is this. We have created twice the size of nation we inherited that doesn't know how to read, write, or think. But the poor, when I meet them, these poor, they have the aspirations. My father earned 90 rupees a month, and I could do something which was not possible. My younger brother worked for Professor Lalitas, who is here. He became a venture capitalist. My youngest brother, his PhD in material science, he did 50 patents. He's the CTO of Raytheon. My point is, this is all from the same village. If we three of us, and we are no different, everybody could have had the possibility to find the world they are interested in finding. Nobody, nobody can hand over the world. Let's offer them opportunities to go there. And they, they're willing to pay for that as well, except that we don't want to go as far as that. Mr. Chief Minister of Estate asked me, I'm going to appoint 200,000 teachers. And I said, where will you get them? Are they in some, um, some, some shop somewhere? How do you buy 200,000 teachers? I said, you will actually hire 200,000 employees who will be kind of human beings living in another century, but they won't know what teaching or education means. They will get a job, and you will get votes. You won't get teachers. So think again. What we did here was trying to find a solution to how to reach out to a billion children who have no electricity, no schools, no teachers who are worth the name. They have uh, no books, no desks no possibilities of getting them in time. How do you reach out to them? Because if you lose a day, a day of their future is gone. They can't wait for 20 years. 65 years in India hasn't been able to offer 90% of its children basic facilities of what you call schooling or education. How do you then bridge that? Just like telecom couldn't in 55 years, we have that same dilemma here. How do you do that? So make something which is future ready, cell phone of education, transformational, generational leaps are possible. It's doable, must be practical, implementable, must be viable financially. It should be not cheap, because children need everything. It should be affordable, but cheap will do nothing. Cheap will actually be counterproductive. Holistic, not partial, must be fun, not a chore. It should be about learning, learning, not rote. So what we designed was a rugged, low-cost, low-power, connected laptop with content and software design for collaborative, joyful, self-empowered learning. And this is the work Professor Nicholas Negroponte at MIT did. And he inherited the work from Seymour Papert, Jean Piaget, and about 50 years of research all over the world, where they said that the way children learn on paper is different from the way people learn on screen, just the same way the productivity from the times of before paper and on paper, or in office before computers and after computer, has increased and improved. Just the way our understanding has improved, so is the world. It's like day and night. We have to recognize that. So what we did was we created something which is, it has only, takes only one watt of power. So even hand can actually crank it. That's what the initial uh, curiosity point was. It's something which can network without internet. So if you give somebody that laptop, they already have a broadband. It, has, it is a waterproof keyboard. Um, it can actually work in villages under dust conditions. A child can walk under the torrential rain for two hours, and that's fine, too. It's a, it's a, it can operate under the sun. You can read it you know, afternoon sun, as well as you can read inside. Only screen of that kind we gave, just like Kindle is. 
but just a little better because it's color as well. And uh, the mesh networking I talked about is unique to this machine. Hopefully, the world will get there. This machine has about a number of initiatives or, or technologies which are not available in any laptop as such. And it's all designed for children. And it's designed at tenth the cost because it's been integrated in a way by people who created most of what computer does. And it has uh, applications which are like Nintendo. It doesn't require any teacher to teach. Teachers are good. If they're not, that's fine too. Teachers can learn from children. But more importantly, if teachers were not educated, they can learn with children and become part of the world, the new world, which they begin to learn with the screen. And I asked a teacher, what was your experience after two years of teaching? He said, before this came, I will go to the school. I had 25 children. I spent five minutes each with them every day, and I taught them something or the other. Now they all come and ask me questions, and I learned from them. Can you, ask, can you imagine teachers saying I learned from students who are five, six, seven, eight years old? It's open source. It's designed as a no maintenance laptop, rugged, and it can become at home like a solar lamp at night. You take it home, charges for six to eight hours in one charge. It's a solar chargeable, bicycle chargeable, hand chargeable, cow chargeable, any which way. Idea is to free up the people so that they can explore the world of knowledge. My challenge with people is this. I say that there is a patient, the patient has cancer, cancer of ignorance in this case. The doctor doesn't know what cancer means, but cancer manifests on skin. And the doctor only knows the skin disease, gives the ointment, which soothes the patient. Doctor thinks he's been productive. Patient thinks he has or she has some comfort, but nothing changes. Disease keeps getting worse. That's the kind of world we are living in vis-a-vis cancer of ignorance, which can be handled now because, like Negro Ponte would like to believe, he's created a solution is for the patient to go and find out. This is basically giving you the mechanics of it all. I'm just trying to share. It's a, this is our Kharata school in Mumbai. Look at the way the ch children are learning. Look at the excitement. Can you imagine a class in a rural area, village, where teachers and students come this way together? Look at the excitement. Under the sun, these are the chargers and how children are learning. This is, they can take it all over. They can go to water bodies. They can go to the mountains. And this is somewhere in Peru. That grandfather is learning from the little child somewhere. And that's also a source of light. So, so let's create a virtuous circle. Let's look at education as transformation agent for peace and end poverty. We don't need it anymore. It can, it's possible to handle it today, possible to tackle it today. I keep telling my planning commission members, if you plan only for five years, it's like we have been through 11 plans. We have changed primary schools, but we haven't gone to the middle school. If you plan for 21 years, just like you plan for your own children, perhaps they'll all grow up into adults. We'll be a different nation. So, and that will be the end of poverty, end of isolation. And does it work? I think it's a mission. Look at the faces of the children. This is Uruguay, where every single child already works with OLPC. And the government decided to issue a postal stamp when they completed the program. This is Peru. Education ministry building, just see this. The foundation stone the Ministry of Education says, Ministry of Education, Peru, and on the top is the laptop that MIT created. So what we say is, if you can't understand much about education, don't have time, you're in a hurry, just think this way. There's a solution. Give a laptop and change the world. Thank you.